I'm a K-I-N-G Baby, I'm all you need In the off-white Rari Baby, we run the streets I'm a K-I-N-G Westside royalty I'm a K-I-N-G Baby, that's all you need I'm a K-I-N-G Baby, I'm all you Welcome back, everybody. You're with Stephen Basita on my podcast, Get It, on the Social Notion Network. And today I have a special guest. It's a guest that I have uh, the unique pleasure of introducing. And this young man has had quite the journey. He died in a car accident and was wheelchair bound and then moved his way into being a collegiate athlete, football player, a professional football player, a successful business owner. Nothing's holding this guy back, so I cannot wait to introduce you to Leroy Collins. Leroy, how you doing, my man? Good. How are you? Good. So thank you so much for joining me today. And you've got such an amazing story. I'm so excited for my listeners to be able to hear about it. And so please, let's just start from your accident and then how you move forward. And also, I would really like to hear about the mental side of this because Two things. Uh, mental toughness is such a needed thing that so many people don't have. They don't truly understand what it's like to have mm -hmm. something like your life taken from you, essentially, right? Yeah. And the life that you knew and thought you were going to have. How did you mentally process it as you went through these stages? How did you just survive through on that mental toughness because so many people just give up and things. And then also, you know, with this coronavirus, I know that we've all started to get to see restrictions ease up and now the world's slowly moving forward a bit. But we also saw record breaking suicide, depression, drug overdoses, drug use, um, domestic violence, all these things that go back to, I think how fragile the, the human psyche really is in today's time. And you've clearly done something vastly different through your situation and circumstance. So I'd love to hear about what happened and then just progress us forward as you're going through the physical side, that mental side as well. Yes. So, um, so when I was six years old, it's 1982, um, I was in a car accident. And in that accident, I was, um, I was thrown forward um, by a truck. The truck continued driving. And while I was driving, the truck ran over me. And then my clothes got attached underneath, underneath the truck and it dragged me for a block and a half. And then, um, and then when my clothes became unattached, the back tire ran over my body and ran over my head. And since so why um, I was laying there, I was still alive, but then actually rushed me to the hospital and ended up dying. And I died for eight minutes um, in that time. And so while you know, they would perform operations and, and, and such, and I recovered, I mean, I came back from death, say came back from death, um, but I was still, I still had broke 14 broken bones and I had 40% of the skin torn up my body. Um, so as time went on, uh, me healing from those scars and those injuries and coming out of a coma, uh, the doctor did say, I never walk again. He said that, you know, he'll live, he'll do this, but he'll never walk again. He'll never be able to basically live the life as a regular kid, a normal you know, kid. How long was your coma for? Um, I was in coma for almost two months, okay. almost, a, almost two months. Um, so, um, but I never, uh, sorry, no, two weeks. Sorry, take that back. Sorry, two weeks. Um, so I never be able to walk again. Okay. And, uh, but I was sitting on the floor watching football with my uncles one day. I was watching, I was on the floor. Um, at this point, I'm wheelchair bound. I'm using a walk in a wheelchair to get around, to get around anywhere or my mother's carrying me from room to room, um, and, you know, taking, a, taking me a bath and um, giving me a bath and such. Um, so, but I'm sitting on the floor one day watching football with my uncles and something inside of me gave me this spark of energy and I said, I wanted to do that. So I went to my, um, and I got in my wheelchair and I rolled to my mother and I told her, I said, mom, I wanted to play football. And I wanted to play in the NFL. And my mother was such a, a huge supporter of me. She, she, she had my back. She supported me. Um, she, she gave me strength and gave me encouragement and gave me that, that will and that fight that you can do anything you want. 
And she told me that day and said that um, she had my back and whatever it is I want to do, just believe hard enough and I can, I can do it. She's with me. And that's all I needed. And from that day forth, every single night, that's all I thought about. That's all I dreamed about was playing the NFL. I say, if I can learn how to walk, I can go to the NFL. If I, if I can learn how to walk and go to the NFL. So I you should get up late at night, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. At a young six, seven years old, I get up and I should practice walking around the house. I used to practice holding on to the edge of the bed rails, walking and um, trying to maintain balance, just practicing, 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 right? And so, like I said, when the whole world is asleep, I get up in the middle of the night and do it. And I used to do it with my football helmet on. <laughs> and I used to have an orange slice in my mouth that I used to use as a mouthpiece, mouth guard. So I'd walk around the house and I did this all the time. My mother wanted to carry me places. I always said I'd, I'd do it on my own. I always wanted to get, in a, she wanted to put me in a wheelchair. I used to walk her. I said, let me hold on the wall. Let me try. So just years of this, I mean, months of just practicing and, and focusing on it, thinking about it, wanting this thing, seeing it. One day I end up it happening, I'm saying, but then also a lot of praying, a lot of praying, a lot of believing, a lot of, because um, one thing that happened that was a changing point in my life, when I used to get up in the middle of the night, I used to walk by my mother's bedroom. It could be two o'clock in the morning sometimes. This is only sometime. I could hear her and her praying, praying for me that, that God can fix my legs. God can, can help me um, do, do my pain because when me walking around, being carried, being pushed around, it was painful. My body hurt when I was trying to do these things. Um, right. So he wanted God to take away my pain, help me, that helped me uh, to live a normal life as a kid, normal kid. So right. I should hear that. And so that gave me the encouragement to start praying as well. So what I did, I started praying. I started believing harder. I started praying harder. And then I started dreaming of seeing myself running like a little kid. I saw myself running like a little kid. That gave me, other than having a desire to play the NFL, once I had that dream of me running, saw myself playing with the other kids, now I had the vision like, now I can walk. And then probably weeks later, I took my first steps on my own. I took my second step. I just kept walking. And next, you know, I'm walking. I'm walking now. So now I'm the step, step closer to the NFL, right? right. So I asked my mother to play, the, play, can I play Pop Warner? She said, no, you ain't playing no Pop Warner. Are you crazy? You just, you just learn how to walk, man. You're not playing Pop Warner football. So I'm like, mom, I thought you had my back. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so this, this, uh, after a while of me fighting, I ended up playing, signing myself up. I was on the team for a while. She ended up taking me off the team, but then I ended up getting a chance to play again. Playing Pop Warner again. And when I was on the team, now this right here was a critical turning point with my football career. Okay. When I got back on the team, my mother let, allowed me to play again. The coaches knew about my condition. I walked with a little limp. I still had a limp I was walking with. I, so they looked at me as a handicapped kid. Okay. So... They put me at a lineman. I was a lineman. I was the smallest lineman on the, on the thing, but they had, they had me in a lineman and only played a couple minutes of the game, of each game. I only played a couple minutes. But the turning point of my career is that it was a fumble that our running back caused. The other team picked it up and was running for a touchdown. Everybody was chasing them. I turned and chased and ran after this kid, and I'm passing all of our guys that was chasing this kid, and I ended up catching the kid before he scored a touchdown. Now they see me as a football player. Now I'm not looked at as the handicapped kid that wanted to play football. Now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm looking at as, as a football player. They said they didn't know I was that fast. They said, wow. But they know it would never get, really gave me a shot because of the fact that I was, right. I was a handicapped kid. They were trying to protect. And then, um, and then, uh, then they moved me to receiver. Once they moved me to receiver, I ended up scoring my first touchdown. Uh, as of catching a 35-yard touchdown pass, and the rest is history. And that was a turning point in my life. Now I'm getting chances, getting opportunity to play this game that I love, that I think I'm going to go to the NFL to play. Okay. So, um, first of all, where did you grow up? In Hudson, New York. Okay, Hudson, New York. So, as you, now you get through Pop Warner, you so you go to high school. Mm -hmm. So, how was high school for you? What happened? So high school, so like now I started getting chances. I was looked at as a kid that's fast. My limp started to go away. I'm not, I'm not limping as much anymore. I'm running faster. I'm getting stronger. I work out all the time. Like I, I'm 10, 11 years old. 
I'm running, I'm doing push-ups, I'm doing pull-ups, anything I can do to work out, I'm doing because I want to get stronger because I have this goal to go somewhere, right? Right. And saying so, um, JV, I get on JV, they move me to running back. Okay. And then so, and I wanted to be running back because I love, when I, my first football game I watched, I, I, I enjoy watching Roger Craig. I, I love watching this guy run and I wanted to be like him. So when they moved me to running back, um, I just, you know I mean? I just started, you know, doing great with it. I wasn't a starter running back, but I was still getting a chance to play, getting a chance to score touchdowns. Um, and then my junior year, I moved to varsity and they gave me an opportunity to be the starting running back. Okay. And I ended up breaking a section two rushing record at running back. And then my senior year, I broke the New York State rushing record. Wow. And all this stuff happened for me because I, I mean, I was always training and working out and having this dream and desire to go to the next level that I never stopped. I always had, I was obsessed with being successful, but obsessed with being, but making it to the, to the NFL. So, then, and so I felt that I always then, had to work. Yeah. So through this whole process, so like, how were you mentally processing when you got to finally play football, right? And you're only getting to play a couple of minutes at a time or for the whole game. Were you upset that you only got to play a couple of minutes during the game and you felt like defeated or did it motivate you to want to work harder? And then also how did that mental side transition for you as you became a star? Yeah. So I always knew that I needed to work harder because I wasn't the starter. I wasn't the guy that they see. I knew that it's going to take a lot more to me to get a couple plays here, a couple plays there to get noticed, to go to the NFL. So um, I knew I had to work harder. So I always, I always came early and I stayed late. Um, I felt that if I did more than the next person, that they're going to recognize me. Um, if I, uh, you know, ask the right questions, they're going to, they, they're going to start to notice um, now how, how uh, engaged and how, um, how much I wanted this thing. So the mental side of the mental side was that, that, there's more in the tank. There's more that I can do. So I always, I just always try to do a little more so than I did. The challenge. Challenge. You just took it as a I, challenge. I just accept, accept the challenge. And, uh, and so one time it was one game, it was one game. It was a coach. So it was, uh, the coach put me in the coach. Uh, we think I was, I was a starter. The other guy was a starter and he was, he was on the field. And this right here was a thing that, that kind of made me speak up. It was like, coach, you didn't give me a shot. So, it was, and I was angry. I was on the sideline, angry. The game went on. The guy ran, ran he was a great running back, but he ran, ran a touchdown, you know what I mean? But then next next play came around. Second quarter came. He was still in there, and I'm waiting for my chance to get in, and halftime came, and then the next quarter, fourth, third quarter came, and, and then he put the guy, another other guy went back in, and I'm still waiting to get in like coach. And I'm the coach. I didn't get a shot. You're going to let me get in. Of course, oh, you didn't get in. So he recognized that he didn't let me in the game. Because the fact is that I wasn't a factor. You know what I mean? I was still a player that wasn't looked at as a handicap, but I wasn't a starter. Right. The first play he gave me the ball, I ran a touchdown on the very first play. And when I ran a touchdown on the very first play, I walked the sideline and said, see, coach, I can play this game. And then I started getting more chances and more chances and more chances. And, and, I, and I mean, so uh, just me doing, me able, able to do that, if I would have talked, spoke up and said, yo, look, let me give me that, give me that shot. I need that shot. I would never got a chance to get in and get that, that run and score that touchdown on the first play. And then we see like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. This guy is serious. He's our backup running back, but he could be our starter. Right. You know what I mean? So then I start getting more shots and more chances. But then, even though I start getting that shot to become closer to a starting position, I worked harder. I never gave up. I never settled with just being okay. I felt right. that I had to be the best, but then it came to my, somebody said that about the New York State rushing record. I'm mm -hmm. um, saying that this, this guy that was ahead of me was strong. He had a chance of breaking a, a record. And then so I was like, man, I wanted that record. You know, I'm wearing the record. So he ended up not breaking it. But then the next year, they put me at the starter over the guy that was starting the year before because they saw in transition, I was coming back a little bigger, come back a little faster. My limp was completely gone. And I, they always saw me in the weight room. I encouraged the other guys. I knocked on doors and said, guys, go for a run. You know what I mean? So I was the one to motivate and push our team, try to push the guys to do more. And then my junior year, I ended up starting. 
took the starting job. And then it was like, I mean, like I said, my attitude didn't change. I came first one in there and uh, last one to leave. And it's not just because of I got, I mean, I wanted that starting job. I need to get to the NFL. And I know I found, I figured I had to figure a way to get there. And I figured the harder, harder I work, I was going to get there. So, you know, so you've clearly been very mentally focused for such a long time in this goal. So for you, it's, it seems like this is just part of your DNA, right? Did you ever have doubts? Did you ever have struggles where you're just like, man, I just, I don't know if I can do it. Like, did you ever have those moments? Like what was, what were those moments? That, that, what did they look like? Did you have those days where you went home and you broke down? Because yeah. you hear about, you know, a lot of the people that, that are the greats, right? And a lot of them seem to just have that laser focus. And, you know, like, you know, I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan, obviously being a basketball player. And you heard about, you know, how he tried out, he didn't make varsity, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't that he didn't make the basketball team. For those who think he didn't make the team, he made the team. He yeah. junior varsity. He doesn't play varsity for a year. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that for him was the mental speed bump that he went over and then shifted him to be who we all know he is now, right? right? Did you have that same kind of, did you have one of those moments where you yeah. just felt deflated and you had to get even more laser focused? Yeah, so this this right here, this right here is, I'm gonna switch focus and I'm gonna get back to that laser, um, laser focus thing. I was, um, one of my setbacks was in education. So when I was in, when I went to the high school, ninth grade, I was, um, I was put in special ed classes. Because um, okay. I had trouble reading and writing. That was what I was, I mean, I had brain trauma from a car accident that yeah. I struggled with throughout the time. I had his laser being focused and obsessed with making it to the NFL, but I had issues with schoolwork, issues with yeah. learning, concentration, focus on schoolwork. And so that was a, a problem for me, but I didn't realize it was a problem for me until one day I'm sitting in gym class. We're talking mm -hmm. to a bunch of guys, my friends. They're, they're in regular classes. I'm in a special ed classes, but they're talking about uh, schoolwork and testing they got coming up. And I'm hearing that conversation and I don't understand what they was talking about. I was completely lost and embarrassed that I didn't know what they was talking about. So I went and asked the questions like, like, why don't I know what these guys know? Like, what is, what is going on? Uh, uh, am I, because I know I needed to have the right skills education. My plan was college as well to go to get NFL. Right. So I want to make sure I, had, I knew enough and I understand I was just so embarrassed that I didn't know what these guys knew. So I asked a question and I found out that I'm in a special ed class that is not learning what they're learning because I don't right. have the skills. They said I don't have the testing, the scores and the skills to get there. But I fought that. I went back to the you know guidance counselor. I went to the principal. I went to my mother with them. We had meetings upon meetings on meetings to get me out of those classes to get me into regular general public. So yeah. um, as as time went on, then you know they end up letting me out of the regular class, and they was like, yo, you know what, you're gonna you're gonna struggle because this right here, you at least graduated here, you're gonna struggle there. And in the beginning, they were right because once I got into the regular classes. It was like different language. It was unbelievable how much I didn't understand, how much I didn't know. It was like everything was coming so fast. Everything was just like thrown at me. Uh, didn't understand like a whole different language. Yeah. So um, I struggled. I was frightened. I was scared. I was uh, paranoid to go to school. I acted out. Got kicked out of classes sometime because it was me acting out because I was afraid to get called on for a question or take a test, get a, a big fat F on it and all these different things. So I had to midstream adjust again. If now I need tutoring, I need to study different. I have to study more. I have to do more than a regular student to learn what was coming, what was given at me. So I went and got tutoring. Um, I stayed extra for extra credit work. Um, I did, uh, had a private tutoring session. And so after all these things happened, I started picking up in, in 10th grade, my classes and such, and as classes went on and, um, and then I end up taking correspondent courses and I ended up graduating on time in regular, from regular classes. So I did, I did what I needed to do there, but then I went off to college and this is where my, in my football career that turned a pivotal turning point. I went to junior college all American, but then I went, when I got to division one at the university of Louisville, I was, third string on a depth chart, a third string. 
And so the reason why I was third on the depth chart is because the coaches watch different. High school, I get a toss sweep, I run around talk, I run around the edge, I score a touchdown every time. Give not because nobody could catch me. Right. You know, division one was different because the linebacker is just as fast as me. They just as fast. So I try to run the outside, they're right there. So the coaches didn't like that. Coaches always tell me, go up the middle, go up the middle, go up the right. middle. And I was that wasn't my style to go up the middle. My style was the outside. So I had trouble there. So I got moved to third string depth chart. So what happened, what the pivotal point was when I was one day, we played against the Kentucky uh, Wildcats. And the coach, they, you know, I didn't get the ball. I didn't get playing time. And I didn't get playing time like I thought I was going to get. Um, and when they did give me the ball, I ended up like, gaining one yard, losing a yard. I dropped the critical third and, third and four pass that I would have, if I caught it, would have caught the first down. I, uh, so I was messed. I was not doing right, and I was kept trying to go to the outside. And I watched. So I was upset about that. Coach took me off, and then I was going to leave the team. I said, I'm done. I said, Coach ain't going to never give me a shot. I just, my first performance on Division One was horrible. Is I mean, I, 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 I dropped the critical pass. I, I can't get no yards. As soon as I get the ball, it's like 20 guys in my face. There's only 11 guys on the field, but I got 20 <laughs> guys out there. I just, I just couldn't focus, couldn't concentrate. It was like just coming at me so fast. It was so fast. I was like, I want to transfer. I'm done with this. I'm leaving. So I was, I was on the sideline mad, just upset. Like, I mean, I'm done here. And then back to my mother. So I went back to my dorm room after the game was over with. I'm um, thinking about calling her, but she called me instead. And she told me to tell her I want to quit. I said, Mom, I'm done. I'm done playing. Uh, I want to get out of here. So, you know, help me get out of here. But then she told me, she said, she said, I saw you on the jumbo screen on the TV because the game was televised. She said, I saw you was upset. And I saw your arms crossed and you was upset and you was crying. She said, she said, Leroy, she said, do never let them see you hurt. Don't never let them see your pain. It said, whatever you go and do, you can go do it, but never let them see you quit. I said, no, I never see you um, hurt. I said, Ma, I know, but I, you know I, mean, I, I don't want to play this game anymore. I want to I I go to another school. Uh, they're not going to give me a shot here. I just had a bad, I'm already third string. I had a bad game. And she said, you want you to remember where you came from. Remember when you started this dream, when you had this goal to go to the NFL, remember where you were. He was in a wheelchair when he said that. You are no longer in a wheelchair. You are in the game where you wanted to play, playing at the highest level, don't you ever say you're going to quit. You better remember where you came from and how far God has brought you. And then that day, I looked in the mirror. I tell you, I kid you not. I looked in the mirror that night, and I wonder what it was that was holding me back from being that starter because I was clearly one of the best players out there. What was holding me back? I looked in the mirror, and I said, from this point on, I'm going to run the way they want me to run. I don't care what's in front of me. I'm not going to hesitate. I'm not going to. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to run straight up and run into whoever is in front of me without hesitation. So the next day in practice, next day we had practice. That's what I did. I went the best two linebackers. So they knew me. They thought I was going to juke and go to the outside. I had to get over the fear of running into people. Just like willingly, like make it my points. Like I'm not going to make a move. I'm going to run at you as hard as I can without hesitating. And I did that. I kept doing it. Kept doing it. Kept doing it. Coaches like my running style. They're like, yo, that's what we wanted. That's what we wanted. And then I end up taking a starting job at, at Louisville. And I became and I I rushed for 22 touchdowns and and got 1,200 yards. So that was a, that was a that was a pivotal point. So if that game didn't happen and I didn't have that conversation, she made me remember. She made me remember. So. That's why I just that's why I got the book here. And I mean I get to what, hey, what the running back means. Let me see that book one more time. Put that back up here. For those that are looking, hey, this is you can buy this book. This is part of his story. He's working on the second book right now. But check it out. Put you put it up just a little bit, up a little bit. So we, there we go. So now you got the running back, Leroy Collins. Check it out. It's uh people can buy it on in the bookstores or online. Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, yep. Okay, I love it. So, I'm going to so, go get so, myself a copy, actually. So basically what, what it is right here is to the running back. So basically what the running back is, it's like at that point in my life where I had to run back. 
So you look at it, you automatically think that it's a football book because it says an NFL and it says a running back and it has a football guy. So automatically, your first glance, you think it's a football book. It's really not a football book. It's about because we all have goals and dreams that we go push forth in life. And on that path of our dreams, what happens? We run through adversities, run through setbacks, run through opposition, something that want to make us quit. So basically, instead of quitting, you run back to the point where the dream was the strongest, where the vision was the strongest, where your heart was the strongest, and where you had the most faith in what you was going after. You run back to that point and you continue on your path instead of giving up and quitting. So that's why that point when I was about to give up on my chance at Louisville, and my mother said, just remember where you came from. You was in a wheelchair. You had a goal and dream to play the NFL. And now you're in college football playing at the highest level. You don't give up, you run back, you, you remember. And that's what running back, that's basically what the book is. It means going back and the same thing. I don't know if you see the symbol right here, it's actually on my shirt here. The symbol's on my shirt right here, but it's also right here on the book. Nice, okay. It's the struggle. You set your goals right here and you reach it here. You're gonna go through all those things gonna happen in life. The purpose arrow, nothing's a straight arrow. Success is not a straight arrow. Life is not a straight arrow. You're gonna run through all those stuff, but all those areas that you run into, all those setbacks, the oppositions, those misdirections, it's to build you, build you to where you, it build you, it build you stronger, make you stronger to put you where you need to be once you reach your goal. It's gonna make it's gonna make you ready and prepare to handle whatever your goal is, handle whatever you where you're supposed to be to be able to not just to help you, but to help other people. So it makes you stronger. So I look at all those things mm -hmm. was lessons for me to make me pre be prepared for what I'm, uh, what I need for the rest of my life. So as we said, the mindset of the mindset of being prepared for the next chapter, like the coronavirus happened, how am I going to handle this situation? So many suicides going on, so many things going on. This moment is an opportunity for me to look like, okay, this is another stepping stone to me to figure out how strong I am, to find out how creative I am, to find out what I really want to do. Because a lot of times we don't know how strong we are until being strong is the only thing left. Right. We don't know how creative we are until being creative is the only thing left. And, uh, and, and what we supposed to, what we should really supposed to be doing and so, so I use that for this. I use this obstacle for opportunity to find out where exactly am I supposed to be and where can I go from here? And I use it, I use it for good. Like I wanted to end, but I used it for something that's going to help me help other people. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's been quite a journey for you. So you obviously have the successful career. Now I had a, a couple of my guys got picked up in the NFL this year. And I wasn't allowed to be with them because of coronavirus. I wanted to be there for draft day. That didn't happen. And this would have been my first time of all the guys that I've gotten to pro sports in a while. And I have a lot of them. Uh, and I've been training most of these kids since they were in junior high. Wow. So for me, this is a big deal. They played their four years and five years in college. You know, all these things have happened. And I was so excited and then couldn't be part of it at all. Couldn't be part of it, but, yeah. Uh, so you got drafted. So tell us I a little bit about that. So I didn't, I didn't get drafted. Um, so what happened, I got picked up as free agent from the okay. Washington Redskins. And so um, as you read into the book, you'll find out more about it. But um, what happened is that during the draft, during the time of me um, entering my name into the draft, and you know what I mean? Like I said, I'm a top running back. I, I'm second in the nation in rushing touchdowns behind Ricky Williams. Um, I'm first in the nation for receiving yards out of backfield. And this is like this nation. This is like every college. I'm, right. I'm number two and number one. You know what I mean? I'm top 10 in other rushing categories. So I'm top notch. I'm like, I mean, stop. I, just, I put my name in the draft and now I am one of the top running backs in the draft. I'm, I'm in the first round, a selection, like the first round ideal, right? In the, right. in the draft. And then my story about my accident comes out. Now, people are talking about his accident. Is he healthy? Is he durable? How is his, you know what I mean, his, his head? He had brain trauma. So now me being a top running back, a top draft pick, now a red flag is by my name. A red flag now, do, do guys want to invest a lot of money into me? A lot, a lot of money or a big a high draft pick on me? And then only I'm not, I'm not durable in the last? Or do teams like pick me up as a free agent and see how things work out? 
you know, that's kind one, of how thing, it one thing I do want to address here for people that, that probably don't understand this is, is first of all, just bull to go from being a high school varsity athlete to making it to being a college athlete. And that's the JC level through the D one level. You have less than a 1.5% chance to be a D one athlete. You have a 0.04 chance. Now to go from being a college athlete to a pro athlete, you know what that percentage is? 0.1, 0. 0.6. 0. So it's 0. 0.1. So for people to understand, you had to be, so you personally had to be in the 0.04% to play Division One football. And you're still having problems, having all the accolades now and everything. And because people don't understand, like, I love the argument where people are like, oh, well, the best college football team could beat the worst NFL team. And I laugh at people and I say to them yeah. every time I'm like, you can literally take the worst NFL team. It doesn't matter if they go 0 and 16. Yeah. And you can take the best college team. It doesn't matter if they go 15 and 0. I promise you there just needs to be a line of ambulances ready to start trucking guys out because yes. the worst NFL team would mangle the best college team so brutally that yeah. I don't even think the college team would score because no. people don't understand, like, how many times do you see kids that are rookies, right, rookies that are not QBs, come and do anything? It's so right. rare that you see rookies accomplishing a lot. Do some? Sure. But it's not a lot. And it's just like no. there's just – people have this gap of understanding – there's no way you have no shot at a college team competing against an NFL team. Yeah. And that's, and that's why the, my, the story that I, I tell about um, from the wheelchair to the NFL is because, you know, there's, there's a 0.1% chance. It's 0.1%. Uh, 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 0.1% chance of me going to the NFL because of, there's millions of athletes that are perfectly healthy at the same age as I am, right. that's perfectly healthy, having the same dream. Yeah. You figure that there are a million, million, um, million six-year-olds in the world right now, think about going professional, and one of them will probably go. Right. One of them yes. will probably go. You know what I mean? So you figure that that right there is just like, so me coming from a wheelchair, it got to be more than just ability to make it. You got to have toughness you got to have grit you got to have a, a, a obsession you got to have a, a vision a focus you got to have all these different things and you got it has to be part of you so when i say that when i dream about something i want something i got three phases that i that i that i i, I um i follow i follow this 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 formula this system is meditation is affirmation and is work so when i meditate i'm talking about i think about it constantly I think about it. I, I become that. I visualize it. I pray about it. I, I focus on it. When I talk about affirmation, I talk about it all the time. I tell a person. I, I speak it into existence. When I, when I talk to certain things about people, when things things that that not happening yet, I talk about it like it's happened, like it's going to, like it's like, like it's going to happen, or it's already happened, is already there. And I talk about it constantly, constantly. And a lot of times when I talk to people about certain things, they think I'm talking to them for them. I talk to them for me because I have to make myself believe it. It's like making your subconscious surrender to whatever it is you want. Because once you can make your subconscious, subconscious surrender to your idea or your vision, you are completely unstoppable. Yeah. And then the last one is work. So the work that I put into behind the stuff, I have to think about it, have to talk about it, have to work towards it. And I put all those formulas in everything that I do. And I mean, and I haven't, I ain't learned that. I, ain't, I didn't understand I was doing that formula for a long time. I didn't understand it. But after I realized what it was I was doing, because I mean, I, I, I try to inject that into people like saying, okay, you want that? Yeah. Okay. How much work do you have done towards it? Okay. How many, how, how much, how much are you talking about it? Are you writing it down and making it plain? Are you are you um, you doing the work that needs to be done towards it? Um, yeah, but I mean, it's, yeah, it didn't happen yet. It don't matter if it happened yet. It's going to happen because you already said it's going to happen. That's where people lose it. You said it's going to happen. It's going to happen, but you have to think about it. You have to talk about it. You have to work towards it. And time is not on your side. It's going to happen when it's going to happen. Yeah. 
I agree with that. It happened was going to happen. Like, I had this whole dream project thing set up right now. This whole dream project, we're supposed to go to California. We're supposed to go to Wyoming, to Oregon, to New York City. We have this dream project, this stream, this stage performance that me to actually talk about what I'm talking to you about right now, about the, the, the functional dreaming. It's called functional right. dreaming. And the coronavirus happened, and seven shows got cut. So not really cut, because we did, we did two of them online. But the rest of the shows got cut. Right. And the, the thing is that it's re readjust. Now you get time to figure out now. You just make, make sure you adjust and just do 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 the do the other stuff with things. Time wasn't on our side. It was supposed to happen. It didn't happen because of coronavirus. We don't stop. Right. We figure out now what's what can we do now until we open back up. Now we just figure out we do it online, but then we we just build on what we already had. And um uh, right. Yeah, that's yeah, what it's all about. has been very, uh, very interesting, to say the least. You know, it it really is interesting, though. I mean, you know, even going back to what we were talking about earlier with the whole suicide and stuff, you know, and depression and domestic violence and all these things. At the end of the day, it's all mindset. You know, I mm -hmm. read this book. It was phenomenal. It was by Carol Dweck, and it's called Mindset. And it talks about the two mindsets. You have a growth mindset right? Which is you can conquer anything and, and you can have a growth mindset, everything, right? Your kids, your job, whatever you do, there's always a growth mindset. Or then there's your basically set mindset, which is, it's just not going to change. Like you don't think you can do something, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to do it kind of thing. Right. And um, it was really good. I, I've, because I really am like you, I have typically a growth mindset in most things. But then I started to see that it wasn't in everything. Yeah. And you should have a growth mindset in every single thing. There's no reason why you shouldn't. And that was great because I caught myself yeah. in where I wasn't having a growth mindset. And I was just like, wow, well, I got to focus on having that growth mindset, you know, in, in every aspect. And you're right. It's, it's just so challenging. Most people just don't have that stuff. And, you know, there's a reason why companies – hire athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, I did this uh, talk last year at a university and it was about um, business entrepreneurship, success, that kind of stuff. And I was talking about like, you know, if you're an athlete and you played high school varsity sports, you're 60% more likely to get a job over someone who hadn't. Mm -hmm. If you played college sports, you are 90% more likely to get a job over someone who hasn't. And if you played professional sports, it was like 99.9% .9 more likely to get a job. And a big part of it was because companies were doing studies on who the best candidates for jobs are and it's athletes. And it broke down into several categories, but one is because you already know how to work with others from different backgrounds, different experiences, all that stuff. You're, you're used to working with others. Mm -hmm. typically athletes are more assertive, aggressive. They're more leadership focused. They're more growth minded. They're going to do things to be successful. Athletes are also number one, the number one thing, they're more competitive. competitive. So they're going to compete to be the best at whatever they do. And so it was funny because then there were some companies that were highlighted in this whole study that really go aggressively after athletes. And, um, there was a car company, uh, Dude, everybody rents from them. It's a rental company. It's escaping my mind now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, they go after college athletes like gangbusters because they know that they're going to be super competitive. Competitive, yep. Yeah. So it is funny, you know, like even for people when they are just watching this and maybe they haven't played sports or anything, like it, there really is something to be said for being – an athlete because you have to have discipline, focus, all these things. Like if you're making it to college, yeah. you definitely had to be disciplined. You know, I, I do business consulting too. And I had to fly out to Colorado for a, for a interview. And, you know, they ask, well, what makes you, you know, what makes you different? It's like, you know, or do you, what makes you different? And then also how are you under pressure? Like, dude, that's like breathing for me. 
pressure. Yeah. That's the, yeah. that's speaking my language. Like I, I was a collegiate athlete. I was a amateur MMA fighter. That all happened mm-hmm. through pressure, you know. And then I managed at one point. I was managing and running three companies. Sure. There's pressure. You're breathing in pressure. pressure. Like it's just that is part of it, you know. And and again, you'll find that athletes are typically higher functioning as far as like business and stuff is concerned because they know how to regulate time, how to do things. You know, they, they know all this, they have all these skills in place to be successful. So let's kind of wrap up with where you're at now. So you own more than one company. So yes. let's talk about that. You, you go through your, you know, time in the NFL and now you've, that time has expired and now you go off into the business world, which you have some stuff to tell us about there. So hit me. Yeah. So, um, so when I first started, I have a, a fitness center. So I started my first gym back in uh, 2005. 2005, I started my first gym, uh, PBF, Personal Best Training um, Center, Personal Best Fitness. And uh, we ran that for a little while. And, uh, but then I ended up getting a job. I mean, getting a job at a plant um, while I still had the gym, but his job was making over $100,000 in this job. And while at this job, something was just killing me each day, like saying, like, like, you got more to offer. Because the job is a great job. And it's the type of job that once you get it, you don't leave it. You know what I mean? So people re- people get the job, they retire there. When I got this job, and each day it was like, uh, you, sh- you should be doing more. There's, more. there's more out there for you. You should, you could do this, you can do that. So I'm now I'm making like $120,000 at this job. I'm, I'm in up going five years, getting raises, it's now 120000 and I want to leave the job. So I decided one day that I was going to leave the job. And then I got all these people ex- injecting their fears on me. Oh, you don't want to leave the job. Nobody leaves this job. This job is, uh, uh, this job is like, you know, you retire from here. This is, you can't leave it. You're never going to find nothing like this. Da, da, da. You know what I mean? But it was just something burning inside of me to say, you can't be here anymore. You must go out into the world. So I ended up leaving that job. And I said, if I leave the job, I'm going to go into something that's going to be it should be just as much, or it ain't gotta be as much, but I'm gonna have to enjoy it. I'm gonna have to live life and not to, you know what I'm saying, to do something that I love to do that I don't, it don't feel like work to me. So I end up leaving that job, and then I end up like doing, staying focused with the gym, but then I end up start doing public speaking. I start traveling, doing a little speaking, being with high schools, talking about my football career, talking about my injuries, talking about me overcoming adversity. And then I said, okay, I gotta write a book. And then I, that's when I started writing a book. I started, I started, um, I said, I mean, then I ended up, ended up writing a book. And I actually started writing a book before, and then I stopped writing it. Started, I, I was on and off writing this book. And then to last year, I ended up sitting focused and writing a book and then I ended up getting it completed and getting the book launched out. And then uh, and I said, now I'm going to want to become a movie. So but, um, let me go backtrack a little bit. So after I wrote the book, I wanted something to tie in with the book. That's when I started a clothing line. It's called the, um, the, dream, the Dream Collection. The Dream Collection is basically, it represents the arrow as you see here, and it represents dream. I put dream on the back or wherever, so it's, it's a dream collection. And basically, it's the thing to tie in with the book to um, basically let people know that you're gonna have dream. When you have a dream, you're gonna go do that. And it's not to set you back or make you quit, it's to make you stronger to, to be able to handle whatever you're about to enter into. Um, and then I do public speaking. So DC3 Consulting, we do public speaking. Uh, DC3 Dream, uh, DC3 Dream is our dream collection online, and then we just we sell a book. And I just I do books. I'm writing another book, and then um, this before the coronavirus happened, we had a movie. Um, the movie is scripted. The book is actually scripted into a movie. So this right here will be a, uh, a feature film. Um, it will be on uh, a movie as soon as the movie op- industry open back up. They go back on their grind, and um, and this right here will be the next top movie, number one movie in the country coming up. Who's the actor? Who's the actor portraying you? Who's actor? I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They haven't got that far yet. The Rona came and, and uh, slowed that down. But um, do you get to have know. a say in it? Say again. You get to have a say in that? Uh, um, I don't. I know. I don't have a say in it because um, I tried to get my sons to play me as a younger. That's why when they was doing the script, I was like saying, you know, my sons can play me, but. Um, they, the guys, the reason why I went with the, this organization, this, this uh, film group company, because they see the same vision I see. I see when they read the book and saw it, um, everything about uh, it was going through, uh, they saw this being the number one sports movie in the country. 
Okay. And saying, so they want to get top notch actors or the next up and coming actor. So that, um, I don't know. So I wanted my sons, they said I could probably have a cameo or they could probably do a cameo. <laughs> but as far as that main actors, they want to make sure they get started. Sure. That like, makes complete sense. I, I get that. So um, let me ask you this. Who would you want to play you? Um, you know what? So I always say, like, you know, I, I like Michael B. Jordan, but Michael B. Jordan. Yes. Yeah. My hands down, say, one of my top five favorite actors is Michael yeah. B. Jordan. I love everything he does. He is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like Michael B. Jordan. The only thing is, he gonna have to be, he got he look older. He look a little older now. So he, if he play my college, he play my college. He could probably do the college part. The high school part is probably gonna be have to be somebody. I mean, but it probably gets to be him. The guys that make him look younger. That's right. They do have a great job in doing that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. How old is he? Um, he's what he's um twenty nine or thirty. He's got like, oh, he can pull it off. He probably, yeah, I think he pulled off it because they get a little airbrushing and a little, you know, editing. Shave, that they, you know. shave his mustache down and all that <laughs> other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Put some, uh, put some of that that face stuff on so he got no facial hair. Yeah, yeah, I love Michael B. Jordan. He's great. I love the Creed movies. But um, man, that's awesome. So, how can people follow your journey? How can they get in contact with you? Yeah. So, um, so you like I said, you want to uh, Facebook, um, Instagram. My my Instagram is Leroy Collins twenty three. Um, Facebook, you know Leroy Collins. Uh, uh, you want to find me there? Twitter, same thing. Twitter's uh, Leroy Collins. Um, uh, Le- uh, LC Collins twenty three, something like that. I forget what it is. Um, Twitter. <laughs> All right, so Instagram Leroy Collins twenty three. Yep. And then uh, as far as the running back, uh, Barnes & Noble, um, Barnes & Noble, you can find it on uh, Amazon. Um, and, you know what I mean, just reach out to me. You want to reach out in any any information you want to know, my, reach my email is Leroy.Collins23 at gmail.com. And, you know what I mean, uh, any other questions you would uh, you'd like to have, when people want to reach out and, and, and want to go further into details, um, give me a shout. I love it, man. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a blessing having you. I'm excited to see how things progress with you, my friend. And for all of my listeners, thank you. You are with Stephen Basita. I'm the host of the podcast, Get It, on the Social Notion Network. Again, thank you to Leroy Collins for being a guest today. We hope you guys stay safe, stay healthy, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you, guys. We'll see you later.